Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Gary and I'm an alcoholic. And because of God's grace, the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous and sponsorship, I haven't drank since August the 5th of 1975. And that's a long time for a guy like me to be without a drink. I want you to know I had absolutely no intentions of ever living my life for this long without a drink of alcohol. And, and I'm ever so grateful on November the 26th of 1994 to, to be standing up here and to let you know that I haven't had a drink of alcohol since August 5th, 1975. And, uh, that bunch of guys over there is from Kansas, so forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> I have been blessed this weekend. I have been touched. I, uh, uh, there's something that happens in Alcoholics Anonymous that I really believe only happens here. And I don't know how to explain it any other way, any other way than to say that what they taught me in Alcoholics Anonymous is they call it the language of the heart. And it's something that happens on the inside of people. That you can see, Bill Wilson said in 1947 that Alcoholics Anonymous is not a personal success story. Rather, it's a story of colossal human failure converted to the happiest kind of usefulness by that divine alchemy, the living grace of God. And I believe that, and I think I understood that from the very first time I heard it. And that is what has happened here this weekend. I, uh, uh, I sat there and I listened to Franny talk last night and uh, uh, give a spiritual message and, and as she was talking it became evident to me that uh, the guy that took me through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous sobered up in the very same group with the very same people uh, that she did and, and so uh, it became evident to me that, that what she, I have today is a direct result of part of what she has today and it was given to her by those that gave it to the guy that gave it to me when I was sober, uh, probably 15 months, and I hope to talk to you about that. I uh, uh, last night after listening to her, Gary and I, we went back to the room and and we sat there and we watched a crazy movie, you know, because we're just crazy people. And and uh, uh, after we turned the lights out, I said my little prayer, which I do every night, and thank God for the day and and uh, just for the privilege of being sober and. Uh, uh, Talked to him about a few special people and may not be so fortunate today. And, and, uh, and I went to sleep. And instantly when I went to sleep, I just fell into a dream. And every once in a while that happens to me. I just dream. I don't know why I dream. But when I get around conferences, oftentimes I dream about some of the people that are at conferences. And, and uh, last night I was laying there and I just fell asleep. And, and uh, all of a sudden I, I had died and I was at the pearly gates. And I stood there before St. Peter, and I looked over there, and and I seen Jerry W. And I thought, God, that's Jerry W. over there. He's a spiritual giant up there in Bellevue, Nebraska. Isn't that Jerry W.? And St. Peter said, yeah, that's Jerry W. I said, well, my God, what's that thing he's attached to? That's old Hilderoid or somebody. I mean, it just got an awful ugly thing. Had wine sores all over her body. And I said... What's the deal? Jerry was a really a very spiritual guy. Why does he uh, uh, attach to that thing over there? Well, I tell you, Gary. Well, Jerry, he just about didn't make it up here. So for the next two thousand years, he's going to be attached to old Hilderoid over there. And I said, "Oh God!" Well, I'm glad he's here. Just really glad he's here. And I looked over, and there was old Jill W. And I said, "Isn't that Jill W?" He said, yep, that's Jill. And I said, oh, my God, who's that? What's that thing she's attached to? And that's old Henryoid. And I said, Henryoid? I mean, this is a god-awful. had bumps all over its back and on its head, and its arms was all twisted. And I said, God, what did Jill do that she has to be attached to that thing? And he said, well, Jill was a spiritual lady, but she just almost didn't make it up here. Her life was so hard for so long. And now I looked over there, and there was Reggie. I said, isn't that Reggie A? 
Yep, that's Reggie A. I said, well, who's that he's attached to? Isn't that Raquel Welch? And he said, yep, that's Raquel Welch. I said, well, Jill and Jerry were all in the same deal that Reggie was. Why do they have to be with them things over there and Reggie gets Raquel Welch? St. Peter said, well, Raquel just damn near didn't make it up here. <laughs> it's a privilege to be here. Now that I've helped Reggie, I'd like to thank uh, the Great Plains Roundup Committee for the privilege of being here. See, I, I'm one of those that believe it's a privilege to do anything at all in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm one of those that think it's a privilege to clean the coffee cups. I think it's a privilege to clean the ashtrays, to sweep the floor. I think it's a privilege to be early at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think it's a privilege to stay late. I think it's a privilege to go on the 12-step call at 3 o'clock in the morning. I think it's a privilege to go on one at noon. I think it's a privilege to sit down and talk with somebody that doesn't have the thing that's been so freely given to me. I think it's a privilege. And I hope I never forget that it's a privilege. And it's a privilege for me to be here today just to share with you the things that Alcoholics Anonymous has done in my life. And I want you to know, when I said a while ago, I had absolutely no clues or no idea that I could live sober, nor did I want to live sober, I was telling the truth. I would like to tell you today exactly what my life was like 24 years ago today. 24 years ago on November the 26th, my wife, my third wife, uh, had been taken to a hospital by a friend of mine. And I had been out on a drunk and in one of my binges for a couple of weeks. And uh, at about 1 o'clock in the morning, they had found me, and I had just crashed. I'd, I'd, it was back during my days when I was shooting dope and, and drinking 10 high whiskey, and that's just what I'd been doing. And I had just crashed, and they woke me up and, and gave me something to wake me up, and they took me to the hospital on Thanksgiving morning, November the 26th. And I passed out in the labor room with my wife, uh, uh, in labor, and, and the nurse woke me up and told me that she wasn't going to do anything for my wife until I left the labor room. And I told her I wasn't going to leave the labor room until I was certain that she was going to do something for my wife. And she brought in a, uh, one of them guys, orderlies that work in the hospital, and, uh, uh, he proceeded to tell me I was going to have to leave. And there was a couple of my friends in there, and, and I whipped the orderly in the labor room, and I whipped my two friends. I took one of the uh, cane away from Leroy, who had been shot in a gunfight that we just went through about a year before that, and beat him with it. And then I beat everybody all the way down to the elevator with it. And when we got to the elevator, uh, they somehow got me on the elevator, and, and uh, uh, we fought all the way down the elevator. And when the doors of the elevator opened on the basement floor, the police were standing there saying, come go along with me. And that was 24 years ago today. That was 24 years ago, about 3 o'clock this morning is what that was. And I remember waking up in jail, not really knowing how I had gotten there, not really knowing exactly what had happened. And I remember waking up in jail again, time after time. That, that's my story. You know, I take a drink, I get drunk, I get fights, I get in jail, I get sober and I get out of jail and I take a drink and I get drunk and I get in fights and I get in jail. That's just my story. And this is just another one of them things. And, and uh, uh, that day I remember a police officer by the name of Leo Schott coming back and uh, uh, asking me how I was doing, if I was ready to go home yet. And that day I was not ready to go home. I was just not I just couldn't go out there and do it no more. And he told me that uh, my wife was fine. And he told me that my wife had a baby girl. Uh, that both of them were doing well. And, and I thanked him for that, and he let me go back to sleep. And he left me locked up in that jail cell. And he had, he'd come back out, and, I don't know, three or four hours later, and he said, I either got a book here or let you go. And he let me go, and I remember there was a nephew that come by and picked me up, and he took me by the place where I'd been staying. And I walked in that horse into that house, and, and I cooked up a shot of dope, and I took a great big hit of tin high whiskey, and I went to my sister for Thanksgiving dinner. And that was 24 years ago today. And that's the way I lived. And I lived that way every day for a long time. 
I remember the very first drink of alcohol I ever took. I remember it was a quart of Falstaff whiskey. And we had went from, from St. Joe, Missouri over to a place called Wathena, Kansas. And a guy by, by the name of Lynn had bought all of us a quart of Falstaff whiskey. And I remember that night sitting there with that quart of Falstaff whiskey. And I, I took a drink of that whiskey or that Falstaff beer. That's what I started with. Took a drink of that Falstaff beer and it went down. And it just, something happened to me. I remember feeling as far back as I can remember that I was always a little bitty short fat kid with rotten teeth and dirty clothes and unkempt hair. And that night with that quart of Falstaff beer, everything about me changed. And everything about my life changed. And I really didn't know anything about me had changed, but that night it had changed. I remember thinking that night that God, alcohol is a problem for mama, but look how it makes me feel. I mean, it made me laugh. It made everything they said and everything they did funny that night. And I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten the way I felt that very first night. It wasn't my first drink, but it was my very first drink of any consequence whatsoever. It was the very first time that alcohol had ever had an effect on me. My very first drink was uh, uh, the morning after a party at my house. My mom and dad had some relatives over and some friends over and and uh we went us kids went to bed early and they partied and and there was half full glasses you know with the cigarette butts in them and and uh uh the dead flies in them and and all of that stuff that that glasses have in the morning you know and my nephew and I got up and we took the the half full glasses and poured them through a strainer and that was my first drink and that was, I don't know, seven or eight, nine years, nine years old, and they were just fun and cool, and you know how kids are. And, and I, I remember doing that. I don't remember any effect. My first effect from a drink of alcohol came that night with that quarter fall step here because it made everything okay. It made everything funny. Everything that was said that night was funny to me. It wasn't funny to anybody else in that car. It was funny to me. And everything I said was even funnier. And it wasn't funny to them, but it was funny to me. I remember we were riding around in a 49 Chevy convertible, and it was owned by a guy named John. And, and on this 49 Chevy convertible on the outskirts, he had a, a, on the fender skirts, he had a picture of an outhouse painted on the side of his fender skirts. And underneath it, it said John. And it was just really cool. And we were riding around. And John was talking to Bob, and John said, Bob, he said, I've got a squeak in this car, and I can't find it. And I said, maybe it's a mouse. Now, it's not funny to you, and it wasn't funny to them, but it was funny to me. And that's the effect that alcohol had on me that night. I mean, it just had that effect on me, and I just loved the way it made me feel. Everything that night, to me, seemed as it should be. My mother's alcoholism wasn't a problem to me. The, pro- the rotten teeth wasn't a problem. The being a little bitty short fat kid, the dirty clothes, the unkempt, unkempt hair just wasn't a problem. It was like it all just changed that night, and I was okay. And that was the very first effect, and that effect is what I drank for for many years. I'm one of those that, that the book describes as an alcoholic of our type, alcoholic of our type. I'm not one of those that that uh, uh, was a two beer oh dear drinker. <laughs> you know, I'm one of those that uh, uh, there was always some sort of thinking process for me prior to taking a drink, and that thinking process prior to me for taking a drink was always a very subtle one. It wasn't really a big thing. There was uh, this time it'll be different. This time I'll have one or two or three. This time I won't drink scotch. I drank scotch the other night, and I was in jail for three days. And, and this time I won't drink wine, because every time I drink wine, I get in fights, and I really get hurt, and I get sick, and I, I puke up all over me and everybody else, and so I won't drink wine. This time I'll just, I'll just stop and have a beer. This time it'll be different. I'm not like my mom. You know, alcohol's a problem for mama, but it's, it's not a problem for me. I, you know, I, it just didn't seem like it was a problem for me. And then there was the times where, who in the hell cares anyway? Who in the hell cares anyway? It's none of their business whether I drink. If I want to drink, I'm going to drink. And I'd stop a drink. But there was always some kind of thinking process. Sometimes it was it was after trouble. Sometimes it was after a success. 
I loved baseball. I, I, it's the only thing I've ever been able to do well in my life was play baseball. And, and uh, uh, if I hit a home run, we go out and celebrate. And, and uh, uh, if I won a game on a on a good play, we go celebrate. And, and everybody after the ball game would go home, and I'd go to the bar. I loved men's fast pit softball, and I had fun at it. And, and it was always that kind of thing. There was either I either drank when things were good, or I drank when things were bad. And and it seemed to me like the only time I really ever had trouble was when I was sober. I always had these feelings that that were embedded in me that I didn't know what to do with, and I didn't know how to get rid of. And I remember that. I remember being so scared. I got a story I tell. That, that literally probably lets me know how I lived probably better than any story that I could tell. And it had to do with being in a nut house. I spent five years of my, uh, of my life in jails, penitentiaries, and mental institutions. And it had to be in, in a nut house, in an alcoholism ward in a nut house in Topeka State Hospital. And they had there what they call a self-appraisal. And this self-appraisal, what you do with this self-appraisal is you sit down with a piece of paper. On one side, you write all the bad things about you. And on the other side, you write all the good things about you. And then you take this self-appraisal into this room, and they tell you all the things that they see that you don't have down there. And I started writing on this bad side. And I wrote the, the basic things, that I'm a liar, I'm a thief. You know, I cheated on my wife. I, I cheated on my first wife. I hated my mom. I mean, just the surface stuff. You know, just the, the labels for the stuff. Nothing you really major. And I got down to the bottom of that list, and I was devastated. I mean, I was just crushed. And so it was time to write some good things about me. I got to the top of the list, and I couldn't find anything good about me. I mean, there was absolutely nothing in my mind that was good about me. And I sat there, and I shook. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me that I used to be a good baseball player. And that's what I put down on that piece of paper, was that I used to be a good baseball player. And the second thing that came was that I'm trying to do something about my problem, not really even knowing what my problem was. And I went into that room with those people. And I read the very first thing on the bad side of the list. I'm a liar. And I told a lie that I had told. And I read the second thing. And I started to uh, tell something on that second thing. And I emotionally broke. I just broke out bawling and crying and sobbing. And they let me off the hook in there. And my counselor put me back together and, and uh, talked to me for just a little bit and told me that nobody's... Nobody is all bad. Nobody's all bad. And 30 minutes after that was over, I'm standing outside, and there was this lady in there. Her name was Connie. And she walked up to me, and she said, uh, there was something that I wanted to say to you in there, but I couldn't say it because you was in such bad shape. But you look like you're doing okay now, and I think I'll say it. And she said to me, she, I said, shoot, Connie. And she said to me, sometimes I think that you think you're Jesus Christ. And I said, no, but I got to tell you what went through my mind. I know I'm not him, but I'll do till he gets back. <laughs> okay. Now, how can you live and how can you live your life sober in either extreme? That's how I lived my life as far back as I can remember in one extreme or the other. I was either so far down that I was, I was lower than dirt or I was so heavenly I was no earthly good to anybody and that's how I lived my life and what alcohol did for me for many years was it allowed me to live someplace in between or so it seemed to me it allowed me to live in there and I never went to extreme everything I did for many years was just fun you know the fights the jails I used to go to jail and sing Jesus loves me for I know because the Bible's told me so. And there were times when I'd go and, and I'd sing your cheating heart. You know, and there were times when uh, uh, I would go uh, 
And I've been beat up so bad that I couldn't sing at all. <laughs> I know what Rodney King felt like long before it was worth a lot of money. I'll tell you. <laughs> but I loved alcohol. I loved everything about it. I loved the way it made me feel. I loved the way I acted. I was cool. I loved the fist fights, the bright lights, the pretty ladies, the racking of the pool balls, the sawdust floor. I mean, I love that. I am not a stay-at-home type drinker. Who was it? Bob was talking this morning about having six or seven DUIs. I had six or seven DUIs. I got 13 tickets in one night. <laughs> and the police stood out behind my car and made me pour out all the beer and let my drunken buddy, Wizzo, drive the car who was drunker than I was. And we didn't go to jail. I mean, I got, you know, I got more tickets. I didn't have a driver's license for five years, and I was afraid when I went to get one that they wasn't going to give me one. And I finally got a driver's license. But alcohol, and I don't know how to explain it to you. I mean, I really don't. Alcohol had a magic effect on me. And it seemed to work better than anything else. I was an asthmatic kid, and I grew up an asthmatic kid. And, 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 and alcohol, I always felt different. I always said that all I ever really wanted in life was have a mama like Jimmy and Joy had next door, or Ronnie and Larry down the street had. Just have a mama that was home and that was there and, and had the cookies and milk. And my mama, if she was home, she brought a boyfriend with her. You know, or if she was home, she brought hellfire and damnation to everybody in the house. You know, I mean, she beat up my dad and my sister and, and just everybody. And, and, and she lived a terribly, terribly tragic life. And she died on Skid Row in St. Joe, Missouri. We pulled her out of a tavern called a, a Farmer's Home Tavern, and we took her to the hospital. And, and I was thinking about this this morning while, while Bob was talking. She died holding my hand. She was at one time the Missouri uh, women's state bowling champion. She started drinking uh, alcohol while she was bowling. And when she died, she was an excitingly beautiful woman when she was one. She was about five foot six, uh, full figure, had beautiful long back, black hair. She was part Indian. And uh, when she died, she was about five foot four. Her right leg was four inches shorter than her left leg. She weighed about 210, 220 pounds. Her hair was gray and matted. She had a scar that that run all the way down her forehead. She didn't have any teeth. Uh, and the very last thing she said to me was, Honey, I gotta pee. And the body fluids backed up, the liver quit, and the body fluids backed up, and she died of a heart attack. And the last thing she said to me, holding my hand, was, Honey, I gotta pee. She sat up in bed and she died. And, uh, I was 20 years old at that time. And I, I wanted so much just to say I loved you. But I had such a hatred towards her that I couldn't. Um, and it seemed like my life just went to hell from that day on. From that point on. Drinking for the effect. And I drank for the effect from that day on. And when I drank, I hurt people or I got hurt myself. And, and it wasn't fun anymore. And, and uh, uh, the next five years of my drinking was hell. I mean, it was just literal hell. I was in and out of jails, uh, penitentiaries, and nut houses. I just, just, you know, well, you know how it is. I don't need to tell you. Uh, sometimes I think it's glorious, all the sick crap that I've done, you know, and, and it really isn't. It really isn't. Alcoholism is a, a devastating, devastating, deadly, deadly illness. And it's the deadliest when people like me are not drinking it. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that that what happened with me was that I had an obsession of the mind. Uh, I didn't know that when I come here. I didn't know that that thinking process that I had that took me out there time after time after time uh, was the problem. And I didn't know, even though I had experiences where, where I would stop to have a drink for two or three and be gone for two or three days or a week, you know. I'm a running drunk. I, uh, I mean, I get on, I take a drink and I go places. I headed to New Orleans seven years in a row. And the closest I got was St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> of 
But when I take a drink, it have an effect on me. And that effect on me uh, was just, I don't know how to say it any other than more. I just, I loved it. And the longer I drank, the worse it got. And that effect literally went away. And I started getting into other things to bring that effect about. And they worked for a while. And, and, and the effect in the latter stages of my drinking just wasn't there. My last drunk uh, started on a, a Thursday night and ended on the following Tuesday. And someplace in that period of time, something happened to me that had never really ever happened to me before. I'd been in Alcoholics Anonymous for five and a half months. And I'd been going to meetings every night in Alcoholics Anonymous for five and a half months. And I remember that. I remember going into meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and sitting to listen to people talk and think, I'm not like you. I'm not like you. You say you put the plug in the jug and you took, you, you go to a meeting a week and you straighten out things at home and everything's wonderful. I'm going to five and six and seven meetings a week. I put the plug in the jug. I've told my wife I'm sorry. I've tried to straighten out things at home. I'm going to work. I'm getting off work and coming home and going to meetings, and I'm suicidal. I'm totally devastated, and I'm not like them. And I was convinced, not by the way I felt, but by what they said, that I wasn't like them. They said they just put the plug in the jug, and they straightened out things at home. And they went to a meeting a week, and everything was wonderful. Ha, 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 ha. And I died. And I remember sitting in a meeting about Alcoholics Anonymous on a, on a, on a uh, Wednesday night, and it was a big book study, and, and uh, uh, I left that big book study, and, and, and I went home, and I went to work the next day, and I got off work with my paycheck, and, and I went and bought a pair of clothes, and, and uh, uh, I went and bought a pair of clothes just so I wouldn't have to go home and change. You know how that is and uh, uh, walked into a bar, and I drank. And it was just like for six days that uh, I couldn't get drunk, I couldn't get sober. I knew everybody I talked with, I knew everything I did, I knew where I went, I knew what bars I was at, I knew who I was with. I just couldn't get drunk, I couldn't get sober, I didn't take a bath, I didn't shave. I still had the same clothes Tuesday when my wife found me in the Skid Row Wino Bar in St. Joe, Missouri, uh, that I had on when I started and uh, she walked in, and, and she asked me if she could talk to me, and, and uh, uh, we went outside and we talked. And I don't remember any of the things that we talked about. I used to have a story that I'd tell that sounded good, but I don't think it was true, so I quit telling it. <laughs> and uh, uh, But I remember this. I remember something happened to me outside, across the street from Sandy's Tavern, and across the street from Tourist Tavern, on 6th Street, St. Joe, Missouri. I was standing out there, and she was talking, and it was kind of like the neon lights quit flashing, the horns quit honking, the winos quit stumbling up and down the street, the ladies of the night just stopped, and I was left at home. I was left alone with just one simple little bitty thought, and that was that uh, if I don't quit drinking and go home, I'm going to die. And uh, uh Bill writes in his story, he talks about the worldly clamors, mostly those within himself, returned. And and that's what happened to me. Those worldly clamors just returned almost instantly. But for a moment, I felt totally and completely alone and at peace with myself. And it wasn't a scary thing. And there wasn't any fear. And everything was just blanked out. And I walked back into the bar and I bought a six pack of beer and I wasn't a beer drinker. And uh, I drank three and a half cans out of that six pack of beer and that was August 5th, 1975. I haven't had a drink yet. And I went into that nut house and I come back out. And, and I'll tell you what I learned in that nut house. They called it a treatment center, but it was just a nut house. You know, we had nutty people in there, did nutty things. And, and uh, uh, what I learned in there is is a very simple thing that they don't do Alcoholics Anonymous in there. They do Alcoholics Anonymous at Alcoholics Anonymous. They didn't work the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous in there. They worked the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous. They taught me literally how to be of service to another human being while I was in that nut house. I stayed up all night with a guy by the name of Waldo. And Waldo wanted to leave. And he had a detainer from jail. And he knew that if he left, he was going to go to jail. But he wanted to drink so bad, they just had to get out of there. And I stayed up all night trying to get Waldo to stay. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, Waldo walked out the door. 
And I stayed. I stayed. And I learned right then that's the purpose of trying to be helpful to other people was that I stayed. See, and the most fascinating thing happened to me when I come out of there. I went to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous every day around the same people that went once a week and put the plug in the jug and, and uh, uh, didn't drink and straightened out things at home and everything was wonderful. Ha, 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 ha. You know. And I managed to make it 15 months. I think this is really where my life starts. I think this is really where my story starts. I think that something happened to me at the end of 15 months that had never happened to me before. I knew, the book says that we had to accept to our innermost selves that we're alcoholics. I knew that. I knew that when I was in that nut house, in that treatment center, that I had accepted to my innermost self that I was alcoholic. I had done that. I knew that. And I remember that feeling that I had. Yeah, that's all I am. I'm not an alcoholic and in anything. I'm not an alcoholic and a drug addict. I'm not, I, I'm just alcoholic. And what I suffer from is something called alcoholism. And, and, uh, uh, and I remember that. And I remember walking into a bar after I left a meeting on a Friday night, sober 15 months, to drink. Because I was as crazy as I had ever been. And being sober really wasn't the solution for a guy like me. Maybe they were right. Maybe I really wasn't an alcoholic. And maybe I, maybe I could have a drink or two and just relax. Because suicide was a constant companion with me when I was sober. And there were things in my background I could not share or tell with anybody. And I walked into that bar and, and walked up to the bar and I sat down and, and uh, I ordered a Coke. And I sat there and I sipped on a Coke for probably an hour. And a black lady by the name of Jean, that her and I worked at the same place, walked up and said, what the hell are you doing in here? And, and uh, she was so drunk she couldn't hardly even stand up. And, and I said, thank you, and got up and walked out the door. And the next morning, I started calling people because I didn't know what to do. I mean, I honestly didn't know what to do. And it sounds strange to say this to me, but I sobered up in an area where they didn't work the steps. I sobered up in an area where they didn't have sponsors, where if you had a problem, you bring it to the group. And 25 people would give you a solution for your problem, and then you'd go home and do the one you want. And that's true. And it saddens me today to let you know that there are areas of Alcoholics Anonymous, areas of life in the United States in Alcoholics Anonymous where that's exactly the way it is. I remember going to a meeting one night and having a guy that's over 20 years say, you don't have to write the fourth step. I didn't. There's things about my life that I've done that I've never told anybody, and I'm taking them to the grave with me. And I don't have to tell them. I'm sober 20 years. I remember that happening. I remember that feeling that I felt that night. Because I couldn't live with the things that I'd done in my life. I know maybe he could, but I couldn't. I'm one of those type of people that that June the 9th uh, is the day my mother died. July the 17th is the day my father died. March the 16th is my birthday. My mother's birthday is March the 16th. February the 9th. Birthdays and holidays. And, and I couldn't stand that every memory that I ever had of anything that was ever important to me would come up. And the only thing that would erase those memories was oblivion in the end of it. It was the only thing that would erase it. And I remember walking out of that meeting that night and walking into a bar. And the next day, getting up and, and sitting there and, and uh, trying to figure out what to do. And, and uh, I, find it, I found it a, a sad state of affairs to have to call a treatment center when there's Alcoholics Anonymous all around me to ask a guy, what do I do? To let him know exactly what I'd done the night before. And this was a guy that was my counselor, and I asked him to sponsor me, and he wouldn't. And the reason he wouldn't was because he was a counselor. And if he sponsored people that's wearing two hats, and it was more important for him to be a counselor than it was an AA member. But he's the only person I knew that had ever worked the steps. And I called him, and he talked to me about the thinking process that took me into the bar the night before. What was I thinking? 
And I told him, and we talked about being, me being an alcoholic. He talked to me about being totally powerless over that thinking process that took me into that bar. That I didn't have the power to eliminate that type of thinking. And I understood exactly what he was talking about. And he said, where you're at, Gary, is it step two? And uh, he said, I'm going to simplify, simplify the hell out of it for you. He said, you believe there's a God? And I'd always believed that there was one. And I said, yes. And he said, what do you believe about this God? And I said, the only thing I know about a God of any kind is that he isn't going to get me. And he said, uh, uh, that's enough to make a beginning. And where you're at now is step three. And... Uh, I said, I don't know how to pray. And he said, one of the things that I'm most grateful for is the people who wrote that book, Alcoholics Anonymous, saw fit to put a prayer in there for dummies like me and you. And he hung up the phone. And I'd been, I'd been an Alcoholics Anonymous, a sum total of probably around 21, 22 months. I had no idea where the prayer was. Meetings wasn't, you know, we didn't talk about the book, we didn't talk about steps, we didn't talk about the prayer. And if we did, it was, you don't have to do them. And, uh, uh, I got got this book right here, uh, down from the shelf, and I dusted it off, and uh, uh, I started book, and I started reading. And some place between the front of that book and the page that that prayer was on, this little thought went through my mind: just maybe, if I do what they say they did, just maybe I could have what they had. I had no sponsor to say, "Time to do third step prayer." I got down on my knees beside my couch by myself. And I asked myself that question. Can I totally and utterly give myself to him? And, and uh, my answer was, I don't know. I mean, I've been dipped and dunked and sprinkled and sprayed in churches. And I've totally given myself utterly to him so many times. You know, I come out far, I have to go celebrate. And uh, that day, my answer was, I don't know. But anything has to be better than what it is. Anything I get rid of, anything I turn into the Father of Light has to be better than what it was. And I said that little prayer. I said that little prayer. And I knew what was next. I got up. I didn't feel different. I didn't feel anything had happened to me. I mean, I didn't see no flashing lights, nothing. But I knew what was next. And what was next was write the inventory. And I couldn't write the inventory. I drew the diagram, wrote the I'm resemble that, and the cause and effects my up on the thing over there, and I got with a ruler, and I made it perfect. And I'd go to write the first thing down, I couldn't write. My hand would get just right there, and it would just shake, and I couldn't write. And I did this for probably three hours, and I tried, and I tried. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me that what I had just done was made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood it. And what that meant was that he was either going to take care of me or he wasn't. And if he did, I was going to be okay. And if he didn't, I wasn't going to be any worse off. And I said the very first prayer that I ever remember saying that came out of my mouth in my own words. It was, God, help me get this shit on paper. And that was prayer. And I probably could have said a lot of things there, a lot of words different. I could probably put a word in there different, than, but that was the prayer. And I came to him just as I was. I didn't lie, and I was able to write. I was able to write. See, a decision, Sam Shoemaker once said that, that a decision is a crisis. See, saying the prayer wasn't the decision to me. It just wasn't the decision. The decision for me to turn my will and my life over to the care of God literally lied in the fact of just being willing to go on with the rest of the program. I'd made a decision to do that. And the thing that solidified that solution in me was the fact that I started writing. And I wrote, I guess, what they call an immoral inventory. You know, because I wrote about every rotten, filthy, corruptible thing I'd ever done. Anybody I'd ever hurt. You know, I didn't... Uh, waste time with it. I just wrote. And every time I got to where I couldn't write anymore, I'd put it up and hide it three or four or five places and move it every couple of hours so nobody would find it. And I found a closed mouth AA person. I went to, I went to this meeting on Monday night after I had uh, 
uh, started writing the inventory. And, uh, I talked about him just writing. And it was on the fourth step that night. And they were all running around and telling people, you really don't have to write it. You don't have to do this. And that's not what it means. And that's not what it says. And uh, the very last guy that came to it, his name was Michael. And he said, I'm Michael F. And I'm an alcoholic. I don't know how any of you people stay sober. And he totally alienated the whole group. And when the meeting was over, he walked over to me and and uh, uh, put his arm on my shoulder and said, come on, I'd like to buy you a cup of coffee. And he took me out of there. And Michael sobered up in Franny's group and on her living room floor. She told me last night. And, uh, uh, and we went to a, a restaurant called McDougal's. And he talked to me about the inventory. And he talked to me about the resentments, and he talked to me about the fear, and he talked to me about the problems with sex, and how I had to get all that stuff down on there. And I didn't understand, you know, what a resentment was. I didn't understand what fear was. But I just got everything that ever bothered me down. I got the problems that I had. I got the fact that I was afraid my life was going to leave, my wife was going to leave. And, and, uh, I got it all down. And uh, found a closed mouth AA person. I went and sat down and I done my fist step. And uh, we sat down and we, we talked about step six. I mean, I shared every rotten, filthy, corruptible thing that I had ever done in my entire life with another human being. And this person shared some stuff with me. And when I left there and I walked out the door, I was different. I can't explain how I was different, but I was different. And... Uh, uh, We'd done step six, and we got back down on our knees and, and done the prayer for step seven, and I had a list of people that I had wronged, and, and uh, I commenced to make amends to those people. I had to go stand over my mother's grave and, and clear that thing up. I had a ton of past due bills I had to clear up. I had relationships with women I had to clear up. I had a first wife I had to try and figure out what to do with and, and how to straighten that out. I had kids from that marriage I had to try and straighten that. And I couldn't have, I couldn't have done it without a sponsor. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. And this guy suggested some very simple things for me and told me literally how to clean up the records of the past. And he taught me how to go to meetings about Alcoholics Anonymous and he taught me how uh, to find somebody that was just like me there and take them out and buy them a cup of coffee when the meeting was over. He taught me how to go on a 12-step call. He taught me that when you go on a 12-step call, all you do is just tell your story. You don't take them to treatment center. You tell your story. You take them to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what he taught me. He taught me how to help somebody go through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. He taught me how to be of service to God and the people about me. And he moved away, and, and I became a, a, a leader in Alcoholics Anonymous four years sober. And I took a, a guy that I was working with to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous one night, and he was in the process of writing his inventory. And he was right at that place where he was ready to write. And we, we'd just done the third step prayer and it was time for the meeting and I took him there. And this guy sitting in the audience, this sober 20-year member sitting in the audience said, uh, you don't have to write that inventory. He said, there's things about my life I've never shared with anybody. And I don't have to. I'm sober 20 years. And this guy looked at me and he said, if he doesn't have to write his inventory, why in the hell do I? And he got up and he left the meeting. And I walked over to this guy, 20 years sober member, and I said to him, uh, uh, I really don't care if you've ever written an inventory. I don't care if you've ever done a fifth step. But if you ever share that with me in a room again, and I've got a newcomer with me, I'll throw you out that goddamn window. And he never shared it with me. Not in my presence. And if people had problems with alcoholism, he was the first to send them to me. Now, I really hate to say that. But that's true. And Alcoholics Anonymous changed in the area in which I live in. You go to any group in there now, there are people in any group down there that will tell you you have to work set. And there are many groups down there that will show you how. Okay, and I love that fact. And I was sober 10 years. I'm going to simplify this. I was sober 10 years. My marriage was over. As it should be, my wife was convinced that uh, uh, I had a girlfriend. And I was convinced she had at least one boyfriend, maybe two, sometimes three probably. 
and uh, uh, never the twain shall meet. And we fought daily, and we argued daily, and there was absolutely nothing good in our lot. She hated me in the ground I walked on, and I hated her, and I, I just couldn't even stand to walk in the house anymore and just look at her. And the very last argument that we had, uh, I walked in one day, and I'd, I'd just done another inventory with a previous sponsor, and, and, and I'd looked at my part. I didn't look at the things that she'd done. I looked at my part, and I said, well, what do I do? What do I do? And he said to me, your part's not all that bad. And I can't tell you what to do. And I said, well, what did you, did you ever have that trouble? What did you do? And he said, yeah. He said, I had that trouble. And what I did was I told her to straighten her act up or get the hell out. And intuitively, I knew that was wrong. But it worked for him. If it worked for him, maybe it'll work for me. And I went home, and we had that little conversation. And she said to me, why don't you leave me alone? God isn't finished with me yet. And I said to her, some days, bitch, I don't even think he started. And my, my marriage ended with those words. And I knew it ended with those words. And if there was ever anything in my life that I wanted to take back, it was those words. She lived through the last five years of my alcoholism. She lived through every rotten, filthy, corruptible thing I'd ever done. And if I could take those words back, I'd have taken them back, but I couldn't take them back. Peggy says something. And she says it all the time. She says, if I have hope for you, my hope for you is desperation. And that day, I think I became as desperate as I had ever been, sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was the leader of alcoholics, of people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was the old timer in a group. I, I had a whole bunch of people that I was sponsoring. And I was dying on the inside. And, and I honestly did not know what to do. And I had seen this guy at uh, conferences that I'd been at, and, and I'd talked with him. And, uh, I'd had a couple of business dealings with this guy, and I, asked, I called him and asked him where he was going to be, and he told me he was going to be in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I asked him if I could come up on Saturday and talk with him. And uh, I went up to Lincoln, Nebraska on Saturday in October, and uh sit down with him, and I related the same thing to this guy that I related to my previous sponsor. And uh, we sat there and we talked for it seemed like a couple hours. And when we was done talking, when he called me down a little bit, I said, uh, uh, Dick, I'd like to ask you to be my sponsor. And he said, uh, what we say is we say, Dick, I'd like to ask you to be my sponsor, please. And I remember saying, please. And he said, this is what I want you to do. He said, when you go home, I want you to look at your wife. I want you to look at the principle of that's your wife. I want you to eliminate the face. I want you to eliminate the personality. And I want you just to look at the principle of that's your wife. And while you're here, I want you to ask yourself this question. Just looking at the principle of that's your wife, what do you want your wife to have in this life? He said, wouldn't you like for her to be happy? Wouldn't you like for her to feel like she has a husband that loves her? Wouldn't you like for her to feel like she can be secure in a person and come and go as she chooses? Wouldn't you like for her to feel like she's a good wife and a good mother? And I added a couple of things in there. He said, just go home and add them to her life. Don't take nothing away. Just add them to her life. I remember thinking about the rest of the day, everything that he had said to me. And he walked up to me that night after we went out to dinner and came back. There was seven or eight of us. And he stopped, and the crowd of guys were just walking. I was walking back here behind because I, I didn't know any of them, and you know how we are. And, and he stopped, and he walked back, and he put his arm on my shoulder, and he said, I'm really glad you asked. Don talked about the journey the journey that we're on. She talked about the things that happen on the journey in life when, when uh, uh, you try and live the way that you've been taught here. Uh, 
this thing is probably one of the single most fascinating things that has ever happened to me. The thing that the book talks about, it says that our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depends upon our constant thought of other people and how we can meet their needs. And uh, Dick had me do some things. He had me write down a, uh, a letter of where I was at in time and space and mail it to him. Told me to write it Sunday and Monday and mail it Tuesday. He'd get it Thursday and call him at 4 o'clock. And I did that. And I wrote everything. I had him explain time and space because I didn't understand. That's loose for a guy like me, time and space. And, and I wrote it all down. You know? Dropped it in the mail. And I forgot one thing. I forgot to let him know I had money in a savings account. And he said to me, he said, you're not in such bad shape as you think. And I started treating my, my wife nice. He told me that uh, every time she acted funny, go buy her a rose. She got a lot of roses because she acted funny a lot. And I asked him why I had to go buy her a rose when she was acting funny. He said, because she may not be acting funny. Maybe you. And he taught me very simply that my perceptions of her and her life are literally based on my own fears. He taught me that. And I can see that. I can see it that day. He said, there are things that she's going to say to you that she said, never said to you at all. And I seen that. And so I went home and I, I, I proceeded to be nice. And every time she acted funny, I bought her a rose. And she done a lot of, lot of strange things. And I never once complained. And there was a day when, when her car broke and, uh, uh, she wrote home from work with uh, one of the guys that I was sponsoring. And I'd asked her if she wanted me to pick her up, and she said no. And uh, all that old fear just came back just that quick. And she explained what happened, and I said thank you. And I went downstairs and started making my tapes. And I called one of the guys that I sponsored, and I uh, uh, took him out and brought a cup of coffee. And we went to a meeting that night. And I never uttered one word to him, nor did I have to call my sponsor and utter a word to him. And we went through this stuff one day at a time for three months. And at the end of three months, she walked up, kissed me on the cheek and said, I never knew that you could be so nice. Now, that don't sound like a big thing. I mean, it really doesn't sound like a big thing. It sounds like kind of a petty childish thing. But it was a big thing to me. And it was a big thing to her. We're going to be married 25 years in January. Uh, and it has not been easy. See, the things that happened to me, the things that changed in me had to be changed. Had to be changed in me whether I was there or I was with somebody else. I mean, I had to change that on the inside of me, that necessity to possess somebody. That's the way I've always been. That's the way I was with the first one, the second one, all the lighthouse keepers, uh, everybody. I mean, that's the way I was with her. They were possessions. See, I live in a world of extreme self-centeredness. And I don't ever think I live in that world of extreme self-centeredness. But that's where I've always lived. I live in a world of self-pity and self-delusion. I say all the time that self-pity with people like me is not a defective character. It's a way of life. And when I'm in self-pity, I can't see anything. I can't see anything for what's happened to me. And the only thing that has ever allowed me to get out of self-pity is seeking out somebody else and trying to be helpful to them. I went to a hospital. There's a thing in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and it says, it says it's talking about sex. It says that if sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. It quiets the imperious urge of when to yield would mean heartache. When to yield would mean heartache. And then it says we treat sex as we would any other problem. Any other problem. And those, so the solution to any other problem, to me, has always seemed to throw myself the harder into helping somebody. 
I remember going to a hospital, a place called St. Mary's Hospital one day, not because I wanted to drink, but because I wanted to go out on my wife. I remember walking into a, a room with a guy that was dying of alcoholism and letting him know that I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, that in order for me to stay here and stay sober, that it was important for me to tell my story to somebody. And I didn't know if he was there for alcoholism or not. But if he'd allow me to tell, tell him my story, uh, uh, I'd be most appreciative. And he was in that state of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And he hadn't had a visitor for three days. And I sat in there and I, I told him my story. And his eyes lit up. And I went back the next day and I talked with him and the next day and, and I talked with him some more. And, and uh, he moved back to Hayes, Kansas. After he got out of the hospital, I haven't seen him since. But I didn't go out with that girl. I didn't take a drink. And so I learned that going on 12-step calls, and I learned that working one with another is the thing that literally has saved my life. Literally. I believe that, that something happens in Alcoholics Anonymous that can't happen anyplace else. I believe exactly like she said, lives are saved. Lives are changed. So you can't get where I was 24 years ago today to where I am today. And it's not that my life is so wonderful. It's not that my life is so much better than yours. The last three or four years of my life has just been hell. Every problem that can happen to somebody seems to have happened in our family. I go to four meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous every week. Every week. I'm normally at a conference someplace every weekend. I'm either out running my mouth or I'm over there doing what what Jerry and Reggie are doing. And I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I have people calling me all the time. I have people that, that I have the privilege of sponsoring and uh, asking me about questions and directions in their life. And I pass on what's freely been given to me. And I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love what happens here. And I guess I'd like to share with you literally what happens here. from the way I see it and from the way I understand it. Because it's not a big thing. But yet it is. And if it's happened to you, you know it. And if it hasn't happened to you, I guess you know that too. But I remember sitting in a place called McCall Pattern Company on a Sunday night, and I remember getting out a book called The Sermon on the Mount. And I remember I was sober around five or six years. And I remember sitting there, reading that book entitled The Sermon on the Mount. And I remember going home the next morning after reading that book, The Sermon on the Mount. And I remember reading my book, Alcoholics Anonymous, that night. And I remember being able to understand some of the spiritual concepts that they talked about in there. And I remember it being a cool, crisp Sunday morning or Monday morning. Remember, the sun was coming up in the east, and I was driving into it. And, and, and I was thinking about what I had read. And I felt the sense of a presence that moved into that car that I had never felt before. I knew for that moment, and that moment alone, that I was not alone. And I remember feeling a tear welling up on my eye. And I remember it just sitting there. And I remember literally just basking in that moment. And I have not been alone from that day to this. I've had seven surgeries in five years. I just, you know, uh, it, I lost a job that I thoroughly loved and enjoyed that I'd been with for 18 years. My, I got a young, my youngest son is 18. Last year he's had two DUIs and he flipped a convertible a month ago. Him and his girlfriend flipped a convertible, landed on the top, shattered all the windows out, rolled over two more times, and they drove it out of the cornfield. Does that sound familiar? 
uh, my oldest boy is born on March 16th, just like my mother and I. And he's got seven earrings. I counted them. <laughs> he's the one I should have told him. Okay, son, you can have one. You know, because I think he rebels a little bit. And if they end up here, they end up here. And it's not my idea to get them here. And it's not that I don't want them to have what you have. It's just that I didn't want them to go through the hell that they have to go through in order to get here. Because living with the, living with the disease of alcoholism, more often than not, people die from it. We're the lucky ones. We're the ones that get to sit here day in and day out. We're the ones that get to go on the 12-step calls. We're the ones that literally get to see life change. There are many people that walk into these places and into these rooms that can't see what happens here. Michael and I was talking just briefly before the, men, before the meeting started. And we're examples of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's all we are is examples of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think my sponsor is probably the, late, the greatest living example of Alcoholics Anonymous I know. And i tell you why I say that. Not because he's so wonderful. Not because his direction has changed my life. But literally because I watch what he does. And I watch it from afar. And I know the very simple fact that what my sponsor does is he lives and he thinks and he breathes Alcoholics Anonymous every waking moment of his life. And I know that about him. And I, that's what I want. That's what I want. It's not to be the greatest example of Alcoholics Anonymous. I just want to be an example. And if I can be an example of what my sponsor has showed me in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'll be forever grateful. I've got a daughter. I mentioned she was born on Thanksgiving 24 years ago. My daughter, uh, uh, when she turned 19, I got to give her away to this boo. Okay. And uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful kid. But he's a boo. You know, I just say that because I'm his father-in-law. And that's what father-in-laws are supposed to say. But a month before my daughter got married, she uh, uh, she went to uh, uh, my wife works for an OBGYN. And she went in and, and uh, got checked up. And the doctor uh, uh, came out and talked with my wife a little bit about her. And then my wife come home with you know, that smile on her face. And, and uh, I said, what are you smiling about? And she said, doctor told Carrie today, or told me today, that Carrie's still a virgin. And I said, oh, my God, where did we go wrong? <laughs> 19, I got a beautiful daughter. I mean, exceptionally beautiful daughter. And she got married. And I can't take any credit for that. I mean, that's her life. That's her deal. And I'm ever so proud that she did the things she did. And she lived the way she lived prior to getting married. But that's her life. And I didn't have any responsibility in that. And I know that. And she got married and I got to give her away. And I got a picture of her giving me a cheek, a kiss on my cheek right there. It's important to me. Those are the things that are important to me. My daughter's married five years. They've got two cars. Got a new home. They make quite a bit of money. She graduated from college. She's graduated from college. And hopefully their life stays the way it is or gradually gets better. And hopefully they won't have to go through the pains of alcoholism. I think I want to end this thing with this little thought and this little talk. I said a while ago that our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depends upon our constant thought of others and how we can help meet their needs. Our very lives depends upon me thinking about the people that I sponsor. See, that's my fellowship. The book Alcoholics Anonymous says that God will show us how to create the fellowship we crave. We don't just walk into it and find it there. We create it. Our true fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I believe this, Bill Wilson's true fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous was with his sponsor, Ebby. 
Dr. Bob's Fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous was with Bill. And I, I believe that. I believe that what happens here in this specific area is that there are little fellowships that gather up together and love one another. And that we try to pass this on. My fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous is with these guys over here. They're the guys I sponsored. And we support one another. And we suit up and we show up. And your fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous is with the people that you sponsor. And if you don't sponsor any yet, believe me, you will. And don't miss the opportunity. There's a line in the book that says that our real purpose in life is to fit ourselves to be in maximum service to God and those about us. And it's already been stated that that's in the 12th step. But that's what we do walking through the steps. We fit ourselves to be a service to God and the people about us. And how we do that is by sharing ourselves rightly one with another. The very last paragraph of chapter 3 says that once more, the alcoholic at certain times has absolutely no effective mental defense against the first drink, except in a few rare cases, neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. His defense must come from a higher power. A very close and personal friend of mine says that if you ain't got a God, pray anyway. Something will happen. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.